This is part two of Military Collectors from Louisville, Kentucky, the MVPA convention. We have got a special guest lineup for you this week, two World War II veterans, one who was a combat medic who drove a WC-54 ambulance across Europe, landed on the beaches at Normandy, Mr. Tom Grasser. I know you're going to want to hear his story, as well as Melvin Richardson, a CB who also served during World War II, right here on Military Collectors from Louisville, Kentucky at the MVPA convention. Roger that. We have a very special guest on today's show and World War II veteran and our greatest generation guest today, Tom Grasser from Kenosha, Wisconsin, and now from Albuquerque, New Mexico, but the story behind this gentleman has something to do with George Patton and the race across Europe and D-Day, Omaha Beach. And I'm gonna let Tom tell the story because it's very, very special. Tom, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for your service, okay? And World War II veterans are very special to this country. Not many of you guys are left, but you have a very special story and I wanna talk about it today on Military okay. Collectors. Okay. Uh, we, uh, Started in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We was, were, dra were drafted into service. After I graduated from high school, I graduated at uh, uh, June the 11th. June the 17th, I was in the Army. Anyhow, uh, they took us down to Fort Ord, California, where we were training, and uh, we did our basic training, qualified on the rifle range. And then they said, You're going to be in the medical corps, drive an ambulance. I said, I don't even know how to drive, I said. My mom got killed when I was 11 years old and we never had an automobile. Anyhow, they said, well, we'll teach you. And what happened was uh, we took it slow and easy and they, they were patient. Anyhow, uh, I uh, learned how to drive and of course a few times I run into things. The fact is uh, I work at an information booth in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And People come in from Chicago, or pardon me, uh, California, and I say, you ever go to Redwood Forest? And they, yeah. And I said, well, if you look up on the tree about nine or 10 feet, there's scars on there. That's how I stopped the ambulance. It's grown that much now. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I did learn to drive, and uh, uh, everybody had gone in service at that time was either 18 or 27. Everybody in between had been already drafted. So uh, we uh, trained, and then they took us to Boston, or Newport News, Virginia, to ship out to go over to England. And when we got over to England, why, uh, we uh, got brand new ambulances. And uh, the one, uh, my ambulance that I rode in was uh, Third Army, we were, we were with Patton. Uh, number 14, and uh, uh, we uh, trained in, uh, where was it, uh, we're at Hankelow Court, and we we're way up on, uh, I guess it's the northern end by Scotland, and we uh, trained on the roads there and all, and we used to come down the roads in England, the roads are very narrow, and of course they go up the left side, we go up the right side. But our vehicles were so big they went very right down the middle and took up the whole road. And yeah, make a long story short, like, uh, we got our orders to come on, go overseas. And what we did is we taped the doors and, and put a snorkel on the tailpipe and taped it to the back of the ambulance. And they had some kind of, and I'm no mechanic, so I don't know what it takes to keep anything underwater for any period of time, but it was like a gauze material with beeswax and wrap the carburetor and distributor. To waterproof it. To waterproof it. Mm -hmm. We came off the LST uh, after it hit the beach at Omaha Beach and went to ground. The front opened up and the ramp went down and the quartermaster had already put in plates so we wouldn't dig into the sand. We come off front wheel drive. And the back of it was like big balloon until we got on land and until we came through. Anyhow, we went it there for, uh, oh, 
I don't know, maybe two, three hours, they said, oh, go in that field over there. And they said, there may be mines in that, but uh, we hadn't checked it. So our lieutenant got in a two and a half ton truck and crossed back and forth and zigzag, and nothing blew up. So we all parked our ambulances in there, and we uh, uh, had 30 ambulances. That evening or afternoon, we took off going up to the front. And uh, we got to, uh, and I may be lying now, but it's a long time ago, but it seems it was Avaranches. It was on the coast of uh, uh, France. And uh, we were all in the convoy, and there were 30 ambulances, bumper to bumper. 18 year old, well, I was 19 then, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, sitting on the bumper, Two planes come over and they drop flares. And, ah, they're going to take our pictures. All of a sudden they come back and they were strafing. And Boy Scouts Honor, they came to those 30 ambulances. Their Stuka dive bombers had screamers on the tail just roar and make your hair stand up. Anyhow, came to those ambulances and pulled up over us. Did not drop a bomb or strafe. Made another round, came up, got to us. And some of us have been, pardon me, would have been out the first night in France. Anyhow, we uh, uh, made it through and pulled in the field and camped for the night. And uh, did not get, like I say, we didn't get hurt at all. Uh, next morning, a jeep comes flying into the camp or where we were and young, uh, I think he was a lieutenant. He may have been a second lieutenant or first, I'm not sure. Anyhow, just a young fellow, a little older than me. Jumped out, he says, I'm going to say mass. Anybody here know how to serve? I put up my hand, because I'd been an altar boy back when I was a kid. Anyhow, we uh, went ahead and uh, I served my one claim to glory. I served at Mass in France the first morning we were there. So we uh, ended up, uh, came in to uh, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Czechoslovakia, Italy, and then into Germany. And uh, we, uh, very fortunate, I tell you, that guardian even was sitting on my shoulder all the way. And, uh, we, uh, I did not get a scratch, got home, or after, let's see, got out of the Army uh, at uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Uh, we got in there at New Year's Eve, and everything was shut down, so they said they couldn't get us out until the next day. So we got off the 2nd of uh, January, 1946, and the rest is behind me, but truly, uh, one thing I want to say, if it was not for the people back home, the women that went to the factories, the fellas, the 4Fs that people looked at as, you know, no good, they went to work. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, so help me, they had scrap drives and the food, the people went without food and grandpas and grandmas and uncles and aunts from that I know what they put up with gas ration to help us. And those are the heroes. Uh, people come up and say, you know, you're, you're a hero. I said, no, nah, I'm no hero. I did what I was being paid to do, and I was lucky. I said, the people back home that backed us up and the spree de corps for World War number two. Uh, at that time was 200%, so help me there. And the people back home are the heroes, not us. There's a lot of guys, of course, gave their life and all. I just outlived the rest of them, and that's my story. Tom, God bless you, sir. I've been blessed, believe God me. bless you. Thank you so much for yep. being on our show, and thank you for what you've done for our great country. Yeah. Uh, we wish you many, many more years, and they're going to have many, many more years. I'm ordinary enough to live a long time. Yes, you <laughs> are. 
Thank you very I much. Tell, I tell my priest, he says, Tom, how old are you? I was 90, and I said, oh, I'm 90. He says, you're getting up there in age. I said, yeah. I said, you know, I keep going around. I knock on the pearly gates, and Pete says, not yet. Get it right. So I got to keep going around until I get it right. <laughs> and you will. You will, my friend. God thank bless you. you. And thank you so much. Thank you. If you have missed any past episodes of Military Collectors, be sure to go online at militarycollectorstv.com. And you can see not only past episodes, but also read in-depth features on the people and their passion of their military collections. I'm a little bit country. Oh, and I'm a little bit rock and roll. I'm a little bit of Memphis and Nashville. With a little bit of Motown in my soul. I don't know if it's good or bad. But I know I love it, so. With a little bit of country. And a little bit of rock and roll. The all-new Chevy Silverado. It's a little bit country. And it's a little bit rock and roll. Take a moment to think about the food you buy and eat. Is it fresh? I mean really fresh. Or is it shipped from a grower hundreds or even thousands of miles away? Well, here in South Carolina, we celebrate fresh, locally grown food and unforgettable meals with family and friends. So choose food that's rooted right here. Choose certified SC grown. It's a matter of taste. Wakawachi Marina, located on the Wakama River in Merle's Inlet, is a first-class freshwater marina. For over 60 years, locals and visitors have enjoyed Wakawachi Marina as a recreational stopover or as a launching spot on the river. Wakawachi offers affordable rates on wet slips, rack storage, fuel services, and a collection of amenities to enhance your boating experience. For a great meal with a waterfront setting, visit Deck 383, located on dock level at the marina. Wakawachi Marina, Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. Well, our letter this week comes from Bill in Bangor, Maine, and Bill writes, Bob, I'm trying to get into collecting Japanese World War II collectibles. What are some of the more unique helmets that I might be able to get into, and what might they be worth? Well, Bill, I appreciate you writing in to our email notes this week. I've got an expert here that I think can answer your question. Matt Fox from Quarter Ton Military Parts down in Chickamauga, Georgia. He is also a Japanese helmet collector. Okay, Matt, I got to ask you. Uh-huh. Uh, Bill wants to get into collecting these. Okay, what are kind of the differences here in what you find? Well, uh, your standard Japanese helmet, just a lightweight helmet, it looks about like this. It'll have a star in the front. Okay. That, that, they're very, very common. They're, they've gotten expensive since all the movies have come out. Right. But if you're really wanting to get into something that's a little bit more interesting, uh, not your norm, uh, you can get into, uh, like, like this is a Naval Marine, Japanese Naval Marine. These are very collectible. These are the northern Japanese, and they were taller than your normal Japanese. They considered them more, um, I guess you could say, scary or more intimidating because they were larger. I mean, they were larger, you know. And so they made them Marines, and it'll have, uh, of course, the anchor on the front, and the later style will have a painted anchor. Um, now, if you really want to get into some really weird Japanese helmets, this one here, for instance, this is a Japanese machine gunner's helmet. These are extremely rare. And what they did is they went one step from uh, uh, one step further from a German helmet that had the brow plate, and they actually integrated the brow plate in the front of the helmet. This was actually found in a bunker in China by a Chinese digger. Um, these were very unwieldy; they were so heavy on the front that they would, you know, the the movement of the gun would cause the helmet to fall over the eyes of the guy shooting it. So they weren't real popular. So there's very few of them made. This one was probably thrown down and a normal helmet picked up. But if you really want to get into weird Japanese helmets, this is a good this is a good find. <laughs> well, let's tell Bill this one's worth what five hundred? Uh, it's probably worth it's missing a liner. Yeah, it's it's about five hundred. Okay, and this one as its rarity. Uh, this one I wouldn't even know where to start. I've never seen one before. Okay. This is the only one I've ever seen. 
Um, I would say ballpark. I meant two, three hundred bucks. I don't know. Yeah. I, I really don't know where, where to even start. Well, most um, of the time when these things, when you start collecting them, you'll get lucky and find it. For oh yeah, that. yeah. But when somebody knows exactly what they got, then yeah. you're probably looking two, two to three thousand dollars for something. Wow. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So, there you have it. Well, Matt, thanks yeah, so man. much for your knowledge. Okay, and Bill, I hope that's answered your question. If you would like to have your military restoration project or collectible featured on the show, just send an email with your photos to photos at militarycollectorstv.com. For 50 years, Ranger Boats has been paying tribute to America's armed forces and their families, not only in the United States, but those men and women who serve all over the world. At Ranger Boats, we appreciate the dedication that these men and women do each and every day, protecting and preserving the very foundations of our freedom. Ranger Boats wants to give back to America's real heroes with our Operation Troop Salute program. For more information, visit rangerboats.com today. The old 96 district in South Carolina is nestled in the western corner of the state and is a haven for fishing enthusiasts. South Carolina's freshwater coastline wraps around 84,000 acres of water, including Lakes Greenwood, Russell, and Thurman. Experience incredible outdoor adventure, arts, culture, history, and heritage of Abbeville, Edgefield, Greenwood, Lawrence, and McCormick counties. Plan your next outdoor outing in South Carolina's old 96 district, a part of South Carolina's freshwater coast. If you are interested in preserving and collecting military vehicles, whether you're a military veteran or just have a love for military vehicles in general, then you may be interested in joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association. The MVPA is dedicated to providing an international organization for military vehicle enthusiasts. For more information and all the benefits a member receives with joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association, go online at MVPA.org. Well, in the first part of today's show, we took you across Europe with a race in time with Patton's Army and a combat medic, Tom Grasser. Now we're going to the Pacific Ocean and Melvin Richardson from Webster City, Iowa is here joining us today. He was with the Navy Seabees out in the Pacific and what a special story. Our World War II veterans, the greatest generation, and here's one of them today, 93-year-old Melvin Richardson. Melvin, thank you so much. Godspeed for your service, my friend. Tell me a little bit, what was it like in the Pacific during World War II with the Seabees? Well, when I first went in, I wanted to join the Navy and I said my eyes were too nearsighted. So then when I was 18, they were draft me and I said I'm on the Navy. They said okay. Well, when we got ready to go to boot camp, they said we're going to, Port, to uh, Virginia. And I said no, I go to Great Lakes with the Navy. No, you're in the Seabees. That's the first I knew anything about the Seabees. I'd seen these uh, folders with a guy with a shovel in one hand, a rifle in the other hand. I didn't think I wanted it, but it was too late then. But it turned out for the best. The big thing was that most of the CB's average age that I was in was like 36 or 37 years old, and I was 18. So they didn't know what to do with me. Finally, one day, some guys were taking a driver's test, and they said, come on, go along. I said, okay. And the guy said, it's your turn. I got in the truck, I had no idea how to run, looked on the dashboard and saw how you shifted it and backed it up and did this, what he wanted, and they gave me a license, so I drove a truck for probably two or three months, and then one day he wanted to know if anybody wanted to learn to operate a crane. I said, sure, I'll do it. From then on, I operated the crane, and we worked on the docks there in Honolulu, and then we went to Iwo Jima and worked on the beaches, uh, and then from there I went to Okinawa. Well, you know, Melvin, again, the greatest generation and the service that they had, what was it like 
for your family back home and you out in the Pacific? Did, did, did they, were they concerned? I mean, you, Iwo Jima, that, that was serious. It was serious. Uh, well, I had no way of, of course, of letting him know where it was except to kind of mild hints. But I think somehow they finally got the idea that they knew where I was. But of course, you couldn't write a letter or anything then to let them know. And uh, there just wasn't any way of letting them know where I was. Well, when you were in Okinawa, um, were you still running the crane there as well? Yes. So was it a rebuilding of the ports uh, for the ships? What, what were you exactly doing? Well, I ran a, a crane actually loading gravel on trucks. If they needed some gravel someplace, well, I'd load the truck. And, and uh, the rest of the time, I pretty much just sat. So, was, the, was the crane floatable, or was it up on, up on dry um, land? It was on land, on crawler tread. Ah. Yeah. Now, in, in, at Iwo Jima, how difficult was that? I mean, of course, obviously you came ashore after they secured the beachhead and all of that. Well, I'm not so sure it was all secured. We spent 30 days in foxholes. We dug down in and, and uh, used sandbags to build up the walls. We lived in for 30 days at the base of Mount Suribachi. And uh, then they moved us up into tents up on the airstrip. But, uh, well, I don't know. It, you just sort of got along with what they did and what they forgive you. Uh, when it came to showers, they dug a pit and the water seeped into it, but it was too hot. You couldn't stand it underneath it because uh, Iwo Jima was actually a volcanic island. And the water was hot and it was sulfur, it was the soap wooden suds. So uh, you just did the best you could with it. Well, you know, Melvin, I, I will tell you, um, it's one of those things that soldiers understand how to survive and obviously you all did that so well in the Pacific and based on all of the hard work that you did during your service, how long did you stay in and then when did you come off active duty? Well, I went in on the 1st of September of 1943 and I got out the 1st of February of 1946. So. And all that time when there's never home. Well, one last question, Melvin. When you got home, what did you do for the rest of your life? Okay, and, and I know your shirt says, I'm 93 and I'm 18 with 75 years of experience. I, I don't believe I've ever seen a shirt that way. Tell me, what, what did you do? Um, obviously, the good Lord blessed you, got you home safely. What did you do with the rest of your life, sir? I don't think I was home more than a month. And I met the prettiest, loveliest girl you ever could lay eyes on. And uh, we got married. And I worked in Omaha in a wholesale house the first three years as married. Then I started farming. And I farmed for 25 years, but never really got very far with it. And I'd done some carpenter work, so I went into just remodeling and doing carpenter work. Uh, in the 80s, that kind of went downhill, and so looking for something to do. And I saw this ad about computerized embroidery. That's what this is, is computerized embroidery. I started a business, it was 30 years ago now, and right now my daughter's running it and doing very well with it. So. Uh, you just kind of got along with what you had. Well, everybody loves a great sweatshirt with a great yeah. saying. They do. Yeah. Well, sir, thank you so much again for your service. Thank you for being uh, here with us today. And I just want to wish you Godspeed and happy birthday on, on your upcoming birthday and many, many more to come. Okay. If you have missed any past episodes of Military Collectors, be sure to go online at militarycollectorstv.com. And you can see not only past episodes, but also read in-depth features on the people and their passion of their military collections. Let's go! Let's go! I'm a little bit country. Oh, and I'm a little bit rock and roll. I'm a little bit of Memphis and Nashville. With a little bit of Motown in my soul. I don't know if it's good or bad. But I know I love it, so... With a little bit of country! A little bit of rock and roll! The all-new Chevy Silverado. It's a little bit country, 
and it's a little bit rock and roll. If you are interested in preserving and collecting military vehicles, whether you're a military veteran or just have a love for military vehicles in general, then you may be interested in joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association. The MVPA is dedicated to providing an international organization for military vehicle enthusiasts. For more information and all the benefits a member receives with joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association, go online at mvpa.org. Every soldier's training is the same, but their story is their own. From the fields of Gettysburg to the tanks rolling across the sands of Kuwait, the story of the mounted soldier is a story of mobility, speed, and the historic power to shift the mighty tides of war. The National Armor and Cavalry Heritage Foundation is asking for your help in keeping the legacy of the United States Armor and Cavalry and telling the stories for many years to come. I hope you've enjoyed part two of our MVPA series here on Military Collectors from Louisville, Kentucky at the MVPA convention. All of the folks that made our visit possible and who put on this great event each and every year, our hats off to you guys. If you'd like more information about the MVPA, just log on to their website, become a member at MVPA.org or go to MilitaryCollectorsTV.com and you can also log on to their website there and become a member because preserving history like these vehicles right here, the one one that Tom Grasser drove across Europe. These are what this whole program is all about, is preserving our military heritage. And the MVPA and all of its members do so well at that. And I'd like to say also that all the guys, Tom Clark, Kevin Emdy, and those key members of the board of the MVPA serve such a great audience when it comes to putting on and preserving military history through the Military Vehicle Preservation Association. Well, again, Military Collectors is honored it's a privilege to be here each and every week to showcase what these folks are doing around the country. We'll be back next week with another episode of Military Collectors.